Hello. He, he just called me a diva. Okay, so we're talking about vaccines today because uh, we're talking about the Lyme vaccine specifically because there's a lot of hoopla about it, a lot of press about it, and uh, a lot of us have concerns. So I want to talk about your experience with it and your feelings about it going forward. Yeah. So um, we need an effective and safe Lyme vaccine desperately. Um, there was a Lyme vaccine in the late 90s, uh, Lyme Rix, and it was taken off the market after a couple of years. And there was a big class action suit against the company that made it. And, you know, I opened in 96, so I saw lots of patients come in with illness associated with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And it was a very politically charged climate, and accusations were going back and forth. And the bottom line is that that vaccine uh, did not carry this kind of vaccine litigation protection and when they had this class action suit they were um, you know uh, there was a great concern that they would be liable for a lot of money to pay out and everything and I think that that's probably why they took it off the market they claim that it was taken off the market for lack of demand but I just don't see uh, a vaccine manufacturer going through all that R&D costs and take it off the market because every one they sell is you know money 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 yeah they know? took it off after it injured so many people is my understanding i've read as much as i could get my hands on about that whole period in Lyme. it, it was kind of a failure yeah and uh so that didn't work out well mm -hmm. and you say why did it make people sick if it did make people sick mm -hmm. uh, i certainly saw people who got sick after the vaccine for mm -hmm. sure many of them and uh some of them well i'm sorry disabled. so you mean they, they got sick after the vaccine from the vaccine you're not saying a secondary infection i saw I saw both, actually. Okay. I saw patients with documented erythema migraines who had a history of having the vaccine and didn't get sick after the vaccine that got erythema migraines and got a documented Lyme case after the vaccine, which... So it didn't work? It didn't work. It did not work. Okay. And I also saw patients who shortly after the vaccine had progressive multi-system illness, like a case of Lyme, like a bad case of Lyme. But they didn't have it that they knew about before? Right. Okay, because there's this conception, and I think it's a misconception, and I think it's just really a semantics thing, but we should clarify. A lot of patients say they or someone they know or they heard people got Lyme from the last vaccine. It doesn't seem like that's actually what happened necessarily. Right. So I think what happened, I mean, you know, the Lyme tests that we have currently are very poor. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard sometimes to tell who has Lyme and who doesn't. Nobody will disagree with you on that. And, uh, you know, if somebody has asymptomatic infection with Lyme bacteria and then gets the vaccine, what happens to that person? You know, the symptoms of Lyme are caused by the immune system going after the bacteria. So if you stimulate the immune system to go after the bacteria, yes, you can decrease the bacterial infection, but you also can increase the disease process. So it's like a double-edged sword. Important. So it is possible, in my view, to be able to convert somebody who has asymptomatic Lyme infection mm -hmm. into clinical symptomatic Lyme disease mm -hmm. if they were to get their immune system stimulated against the bacteria. I see. And it's a huge problem because there was another component to the Lyme vaccine, the first one that they thought of, which may, cause, may have caused a strict autoimmune process. And for this new vaccine, they took that part of the vaccine out. So, but it doesn't speak to the potential problem of what if someone has a symptomatic Lyme infection. Like it still could be a problem in that aspect. And I think it's you know? important to clarify what you mean by an asymptomatic Lyme infection, because I think people that come to this page, so our page, know they have Lyme or suspect they have Lyme, but they don't, what, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that they have, they're carrying Lyme, they have it, but they don't know because they don't have symptoms and they they've been yeah. exposed and people tell me all the time, well, I, I don't have it, I've never, I don't hike, I don't do the, well, you're exposed, you live in the world, you might have it and not yeah, know. Yeah, this is just an example of how upside down this paradigm about Lyme is because, you know, one thing that was made clear in the first Lyme vaccine study is that 11% of the control group turned positive by IgG 5-band CDC criteria. And, you know, CDC states that their criteria doesn't capture 90% of cases of Lyme. So if 11% turned positive, the math would imply that roughly 100% of the population is affected with Lyme. And that further wow. implies that we're very good at fighting Lyme off. And maybe uh, symptomatic Lyme is actually the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what does happen. I think that these are really common infections. And luckily, most of us fight them off pretty well. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some really nasty strains out there. And there are some patients, unfortunately, who have very susceptible genetics. And they can get even a not so nasty strain and get very sick. And you get this whole kind of permutations of combinations of genetics and strain heterogeneity 
and these other infections like Bartonella, which presents so similarly, and it accounts for this whole spectrum of illness to health. You know, no symptoms all the way to debilitating symptoms and even, you know, death in some cases. So um, it's, you know, there are a big question marks. It's hard to get your head around it though. You know, it doesn't look like the same disease. You know, no symptoms, horrible symptoms, and right. doctors like things to put, doctors like stuff that's in a box, you know, right. it's easy for them to digest it. Right. But it's not the way it is. I think that from the patient's point of view, uh, a major concern is that these va this vaccine, say it works for Lyme, how many strains of Lyme could it possibly work for? And the other concern is people may have a false sense of security because it's not going to inoculate you against Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Bartonella, Babesia. These things can be worse than many strains of Lyme. And I'm worried about the false sense of security. And I'm also worried that this vaccine doesn't have much purpose when it can only cover a couple strains of Lyme at most anyway. And yeah. it has a big risk factor potentially. So, you know, false sense of security is a real thing. I know that um, and it happens not just in patients among doctors too. Mm -hmm. With the experience with the first vaccine, I do remember um, patients who said that they went to their doctor because they had the Lyme vaccine. And then when they had a case of you know, in, in some cases, well-documented Lyme, it was ignored because they were told that they couldn't get Lyme because they had the Lyme vaccine. Mm -hmm. So we can't assume 100% effectiveness of any vaccine. There's so many different strains of this bacteria and these other infections, Dana is correct, it won't provide, by definition, any protection against Bartonella or Babesia or Lichia anaplasma. And I really think that my sickest patients are patients with Bartonella. Um, my most refractory to treatment patients, you know, Bartonella and Babesia, have very similar symptoms in many respects, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they get confused with Babesia all the time. What, what about, I'm sorry to go off topic, but this has been on our minds, and we've been talking about this, the Babesia, the concept of a Babesia herx. Can you please clarify whether, because I always thought you don't herx from Babesia, but I, I hear from one. people all the time, and I think maybe they're herxing from Bartonella or something else. I think so else. too, I think so okay. too. I don't think there's a Herxheimer with Babesia. There's no Herxheimers with malaria. Yeah, um, we just had lunch with somebody who has malaria. Right, malaria. Hello. Many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but uh, we yeah. asked them if they herxed when they were treated for malaria. They spent a lot of time overseas, and um, they they did not have a herx. That's funny. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So so, uh, you know, the, because they overlap so much. As you say, how do they overlap? Barton and Babesia. Mm -hmm. They both can cause anemia. They both can cause fatigue. They both can cause lymph node swelling. They both can cause fevers. They both can cause which we call it enlarged spleens yep. they both can cause night sweats mm -hmm. you know this is a huge overlap it's just that bartonella can cause neurologic symptoms and psychiatric. cardiac symptoms and psychiatric and joint whereas i don't think babesia does that right. um, not to the extent that bartonella does certainly right. i mean there are some cases of central nervous system malaria so i'm not saying babesia can't do a lot of things mm -hmm. but i do i just think that it's um it's not as multi-system as Bartonella is, and it is getting confused a lot, and a the, lot, a lot. And the reason this distinction is important is because it informs treatment. It does. I mean, I would love to say, oh, you have Bartonella, the best treatment's Rifampin, or the best treatment's Bactrim, what have you. I found that not always to be the case. I think there are some stereotypes where the Bartonella stereotypical drugs will sometimes work better. Sometimes not, though. I wish. Unfortunately, there's no standard of treatment for Bartonella. There's a standard for Lyme, and it stinks. Mm -hmm with high relapse rate, and there is no standard for Bartonella. They haven't done appropriate studies. It's, a, it's like the Wild West. It is, it is, and, and I would like to share that I didn't take Bactrim or Rapampin for Bartonella. Um, or Quinolones. Or Quinolones. I did really well with other with other drugs, like um, tetracycline. I did very well with liposomal artemisinin. I did very well with um, liposomal oil of oregano. And I did lots of other stuff, Diflucan, but I um, didn't do those and I got well without them. So I don't want people to be freaked out that they have to try these big scary drugs. You don't necessarily have to. And The way I play it now is that I say, if you, if you identify the process mm -hmm. and you have Bartonella, mm -hmm. at least it opens the door to some of these scary drugs right. if nothing else works. Right, because exactly. those, that door would generally be closed yeah. for a lot of people. Right. And, um, and also just knowing how some of these complex cases of Bartonella works, because there's a way to organize those scary drugs. Mm -hmm. Like um, for Rifampin, for example. So many mm -hmm. patients come in and they're on Zithromax and Rifampin. 
we kind of know that you can't treat Bartonella with rifampin by itself. And they say, well, I'm not on rifampin by itself. I'm on Zithromax with rifampin. Mm -hmm. Zithromax doesn't cross blood-brain barrier. So essentially, you're treating the brain with just rifampin. So combinations of just Zithromax and rifampin. And why do you need two? So you need two that cross the blood-brain barrier. You really need two to, it's a single drug regimens for Bartonella and Brucella, which are close cousins. Mm -hmm. They don't work. Mm. They, they not mm. well. You know, mm. I do start people on single drugs with my. You know, but I we add in options as we go along. Mm -hmm. I, I love. Always, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, just put a toe in the water first. You don't yeah. know how people are gonna react. Yeah. I mean, some people who put them on tetracycline, they got 104 fever for a Herxheimer, and you just can't predict who that'll happen to. So you have to start slow in my book. But then once you establish safety, then you can ramp it up a little bit. I love Ed Bright. Ed Breitschweit's quote, quote about uh, you can't float a human horse or dog in yeah. enough doxy to cure Bartonella. And right. that's it's true. does seem to be true. Right. Um, we, we talked to multiple people who get a tick bite, go on to take four or six or eight weeks of doxy and feel that they don't understand why they have lingering symptoms. And a lot of times I feel like it's because it's not Lyme, it's Bartonella that's causing those Well, Lyme can, symptoms. no, Lyme can be refractory to treatment too. And sure, Lyme can certainly... well mine was, but then I had Bartonella, so. Right, yeah. no, they're both, they both can cause chronic illness. The question mm -hmm. is, there's a different flavor sometimes with Bartonella mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are clinical features and there are, you know, there's um, some blood work stuff. Not just talking about antibody tests. Mm -hmm. They're not good to follow. There are other markers of C-reactive proteins and VEGFs, which is vascular endothelial growth factor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, a few other complex kind of markers. I think we had a Bartonella video on yes. here sometime. Yes, we can't do enough of them because it's so important. Yeah, no, I've been uh, talking about Bartonella um, for a while now, ever since I came to the realization of the holy crap moment that my sickest patients were Bartonella patients. I yeah. mean, it's just like, you know, you specialize in a field for a long time, you're like, oops, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how embarrassing. Medicine, yeah. you shouldn't be embarrassed Not because embarrassed, at least you're willing to evolve. Most doctors just don't and they won't. So I'm not um, saying Lyme is bad. Lyme can cause a lot of bad things. It's just that my the patients that wind right. up in a regular basis in the emergency room are my Bartonella patients. Right, right, sure. right. Yeah. I, I understand. Okay. Well, thanks. Is there anything else? Did we cover our... No, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And it's it's uh, it's nice you take the time to, to watch. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We appreciate you being okay. here. Okay, take Bye. care.